Hello, my fellow rebel capitalists. I hope you are well. Got an economic story that I think will really shed light on what's happening in global markets today, specifically in the United States, and will help you make better decisions or better financial decisions for yourself and your family moving forward and how to adjust your portfolio accordingly. The video we did yesterday talking about how cryptocurrency has contributed significantly to the quote unquote wealth or at least paper wealth that Americans have today, which allows them, and not all of them, of course, but a good percentage of them to be far more choosy about when they want to go back to work. Now, this isn't a result of their increased productivity. If anything, it's resulting in less productivity. And I'm not here to blame those crypto investors. It, it's, it's a very rational decision. Uh, the person or the entity that is to blame for these distortions that we're seeing in the labor market and therefore in the economy is the Federal Reserve because they are pushing investors further and further and further out the risk curve because of something called financial repression. So what is financial repression? That is where the Fed basically pegs the yield curve or tries to keep interest rates lower than the rate of inflation. So in other words, negative real rates. That's what we're talking about. So if you have negative real rates, what does that do to uh, savers? What does that even do to people who own a good dividend paying stock? Well, if the inflation rate is high enough, and by the way, what inflation rate matters? Is it the CPI at the end of the day? Absolutely not. Is it, uh, you know, is it the dollar against the euro on the DXY? Not really. The inflation rate that really matters is how much is the price of the stuff you buy daily going up or down. And we know definitively that in 2020 and 2021, it has gone up far higher, most likely, than the dividends that you are getting on any stocks you own, or it's definitely going up far higher than any bonds that you own denominated in dollars, which is important because you need those dollars to pay your bills. So uh, this is a real problem for quote unquote investors. So what do you do? Well, if you're a retiree, if you're anyone that needs that income moving forward into the future in order to survive, because either you can't produce as much as you once did, or maybe you're in that category that you don't want to produce <laughs> as much as you used to by going in and, and going to work, well, then you've got to figure out a solution. So if the rate of interest, or excuse me, if the rate of inflation is higher than the return that you're getting on your portfolio, especially in terms of cash flow, then the only option is for you to go further and further out the risk curve, which is, in my opinion, why we're seeing so many stocks like Facebook, like Tesla, just go to the moon because investors don't have any choice at the end of the day. And you just see all these massive capital flows and it's just supply and demand. If you're not increasing the amount of stocks that are available to purchase at the same rate that you are increasing the amount of dollars that are on the balance sheet of non-bank entities in the real economy. And then you layer over top of that, the fact that they have to take those dollars because they're like a hot potato. And the average Joe and Jane has to do something with those dollars because they're losing purchasing power, even if those dollars are in the form of bonds that are paying them whatever, two or 3%, even if those dollars are in stocks that are paying them a six or 7% dividend yield, uh, regardless of the capital gains, you can't live on capital gains, right? You can't take your capital gains down to the grocery store and trade them in for milk and bread. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta sell in order to realize those capital gains. And then you spend that money and it's gone. It's not producing any income as opposed to a dividend paying stock 
where it just produces cash. You use that cash to pay your bills, but you still own the asset. Another good example would be a rental property. So this is a big problem for investors. And I think this move into cryptocurrencies, into NFTs is an example of the Fed forcing people out the risk curve just to stay afloat and just to make just to try to prevent their portfolio from losing purchasing power to the rate of inflation. And because we have seen such astronomical gains in some of these cryptocurrencies and the ones that are, are even a joke, uh, such as Dogecoin, it uh, allows people to have the option of maybe going back to work or not going back to work and producing goods and services. So at the end of the day, this is really distorting the economy tremendously. But I wanted to go over some articles that really back up this hypothesis. And then I want to give credit where credit is due. Uh, the, the hypothesis uh, first came to my attention through Juliet de Klerk on Macro Voices. And then also my good buddy, Joseph Wang, who used to work at the Fed and be in charge of the New York trading desk. So he was the guy that actually did quantitative easing. And he has a tremendous blog. And um, I can't remember the name of the blog. I apologize. But Google Joseph Wang, a blog, uh, Fed, and I'm sure it will come up. And this is one of his recent blog posts, which are a little shorter, but uh, just as thorough as a blog post that you would expect from all of our favorites, Lynn Alden. So let's go into the first uh, video that I think highlights what I'm saying. And there's something about comedy where it seems to really illustrate or punctuate the reality or the insanity of the world you're living in at that time. There, there's nothing that seems to communicate that better than through comedy. So this is a gentleman that goes by the name of Remy. And uh, he put out this video at the end of April, 2021. And it really dives into the dilemma that we were talking about with the Fed push, pushing people so far out the risk curve and creating this financial repression, negative real rates. So then they have to go into these highly speculative assets such as Dogecoin. And then it really shows just the insanity of this entire process. So I think you guys will get a kick out of this. Let me go ahead and I'll back up here to the very beginning and we'll give this a play. <laughs> it's, I like the picture of Warren Buffett in the background. Uh, you guys are going to turn up the volume. You're going to get a kick out of this for sure. Bad news for savers as even those with high interest savings accounts are seeing their money disappear thanks to inflation. But first, we'll detail every possible thing you could die from. He's a rational investor. Do the damn not just a save some of his paycheck just like all his ancestors. You looking for high yields? That's never the case. He's seeking 6% returns. Slow and steady wins the race. When he checks his accounts just to see what they're fielding, it's like driving in Maryland. Ain't nobody yielding. What is he to do? He shouldn't be in a drought. So he visits his advisor just to sort it all out. Inflation's higher than your bond rate. That's what I was fearing. So your savings account is slowly disappearing. And your CDs are pointless. That's not very funny. What would you like me to do? Put it all in dog money. Dog money, dog money, dog money, dog money. Dog money. I'm trading it in for dog money, dog money, dog money, dog money, dog money. Dog money, dog money. There's a, about 30 seconds left in the video. I'd highly suggest checking it out on YouTube. 
and the sake of time, we'll stop it there. But you get the point. So, it, it, <laughs> like I said, uh, it's it's really a entertaining to say the least. Uh, I was almost in tears when I first saw this video. And this guy, by the way, was on Jim Grant's podcast this morning. That's where I found out about this song because Jim Grant was playing it. So I want to give a hat tip to him as well. But it really shows what we were talking about. And that, uh, you know, this guy is doing the quote unquote smart thing. He's trying to get a five or 6% return. But when he's looking around him, it becomes obvious that even though he might be getting that four or 5% return, that he is actually losing purchasing power to the rate of inflation. So then he says, well, I'm just going to go further out the risk curve. And then he goes into Dogecoin, which the guy calls dog money or dog coin or whatever it is. And that's how he solves his problem. But we know how that ends. And uh, it, it doesn't end well, usually for the retail investor. I'm someone that firmly believes that the market will hurt over the long run as many people as possible. It's just the way we're hardwired as human beings. We all have FOMO. We all have, uh, we base our decisions usually on emotion when it comes to quote unquote investing. And uh, this drives people into, or this drives people the same way that it did in the tulip bubble to go into Dogecoin or any other one of these you know, cryptocurrencies that really are are quite literally a joke. And um, now, I obviously, I'm not talking about Bitcoin. I'm not talking about Ethereum. But I think a lot of the people that are attracted to those cryptocurrencies initially come in for all the wrong reasons. I think, and I'm not talking about everyone, but I am talking about a, a significant percentage of the people that come into Bitcoin, as an example, come in for the same reasons that this gentleman did in this parody rap video. That's because the Fed has pushed them so far out the risk curve that they need to get a return. And they see all their buddies making 20, 30, 50, 100% or more in Bitcoin. And that's what attracts them initially. It's all about greed and speculation. But fortunately, uh, with Bitcoin, when a lot of those investors get turned on to it in the first place, they go down the rabbit hole and then they realize the real reason for owning Bitcoin, and that's because it has the potential uh, to be sound money. And then they start to understand Austrian economics, and then they start to, I think, buy or maybe hold Bitcoin for all the right reasons instead of initially being attracted to it for all the wrong reasons. But uh, regardless, I think this is uh, a pervasive attitude for many retail investors and uh they've done well uh as of now and uh how well you may be asking let's go to a chart uh, this is from coin market cap so this gives us kind of a a glimpse as to what is happening on the balance sheet at least in paper for a lot of these individuals that are buying crypto assets and this would include I think the total market cap for all cryptocurrency. And you can see right here that even going back to uh, the middle of 2020, total market cap was about $344 billion. And then that goes pretty much in a straight line, goes parabolic all the way to $2.2 trillion. And then sure, it goes back down, but now it goes up and then back down. And we're still at over one, well, let's call it 1.7 or so trillion dollars. And that's just up from the last, in the last uh, year, it's gone up by that much. So that's how much the, the, the dollar assets in cryptocurrency have appreciated in value on the balance sheet of some of these non-bank entities, the average Joe and Jane, in the real economy. So that is a tremendous amount of purchasing power that these people now have on paper. And we'll see how that plays out. 
you know, for a moment, do you see what I was doing there, Josh? For a moment, I was looking down at my camera because I forgot I had this one. <laughs> I'm not used to all this new high-tech equipment. <laughs> I was looking down at this camera again instead of the chart. But uh, <laughs> you guys get my drift. So where am I going with this? I had an awesome conversation today with my good buddy, Emil Kalinowski. And that interview will be up on the Rebel Cap, or excuse me, on the George Gammon channel very soon. But we went over these statistics from the BIS. And what's fascinating is they have these five metrics that they use that predict to a reasonable degree of accuracy as to whether or not a country will have a banking crisis. And I know it sounds like I'm going off on a tangent right here, but trust me, I'm not. So we're going to bring this right back, come full circle and connect the dots. So it calls it these uh, uh, EWI. That's just early warning indicator. So they have all of these studies done on these early warning indicators. And let's pull up some charts so you guys can see what I'm talking about. Three of the major early warning indicators are credit to GDP. And so that is total credit in the economy relative to GDP. So this would be sovereign. This would be uh, well, public and private debt. Let's just put it that way. And what these lines represent is the delta from the trend, the historic trend. And so this dotted line on the top would be, uh, you know, the top uh, 25th, or would probably be the 75th percentile. And then the uh, bottom would be the 25th percentile. And then we've got the median, basically, which, which is kind of what we're, what's most important right in the middle. And that's uh, indicated by this solid red line. So again, this is not to say that, let's just say this point where I'm pointing right now is 8% uh, higher than zero is to say that it's 8% higher than a historic trend as far as the increase in credit to GDP. And this zero and this vertical line that you see, that's at the time of a banking crisis. So you can see what usually happens in the quarters leading up to a banking crisis in terms of the delta of credit to GDP relative to the historic trend line. That's what this is showing us. And it's not only doing it with credit to GDP, but also total DSR, which is the debt service ratio. And this would be, uh, I don't want to get into the weeds too much here, but that's a measurement of uh, exports. And uh, it doesn't really apply to the dollar because this is assuming that a country has dollar denominated uh, debt and therefore they need exports to service that dollar denominated debt, assuming that they're getting dollars for those exports that they are sending out of the country. Uh, then the property price gap, and this is huge. You'll notice the uh, two biggest factors or the two most powerful metrics in predicting if there's going to be a banking failure in the country is this credit to GDP and the property price gap. So this, again, is not saying that property prices, and these are real prices adjusted for inflation, uh, have gone up in this highest percentile by 24%. That's saying that it's gone up by 24% from a historic trend. So that's, that's very important. But what's interesting here is usually the peak in the property price precedes the banking crisis by call it eight quarters. And that would make sense because when you have those mortgage-backed securities or mortgage-backed sausages uh, that are being defaulted, you know, a lot of those live on the balance sheet of these banks. And therefore, when those payments aren't being made, the uh, market value of those assets goes down and it becomes harder for them to access the liquidity they need to survive. That's exactly what happened with Lehman Brothers. But the prices need to fall uh, for a certain amount of time in order for that to happen. Where am I going with this? Well, what I think has happened in markets like the United States is uh, 
the yes, the property prices are important. Why? Because the majority of people's net worth is in their house. And therefore, that equates to future purchasing power when they sell that house or extract the equity through a cash out refi. And that's how they're going to live into their you know, retirement years uh, combined with Social Security or maybe a 401k or in uh, Remy's case, a 401k nine. <laughs> I thought that was a really good joke, but uh <laughs> I can't wait for that guy to come out with another video. But we know that that's why real estate prices are so crucial to countries like the United States, because that equity represents future spending. And one man's spending is another man's income. And especially when you have a society that's completely over leveraged, they need that income to stay the same in order to service their debt. If they don't, then you have all these defaults. And again, we go right back to the, the GFC. But I would argue that now there is a metric that could be even more important in the United States than housing prices. And that would be the stock market. And my rationale for that would be a thought experiment that we can all walk through very easily. So just think about what would happen if housing prices went down by 50% in the United States. Think about what would that would do to the economy if those housing prices stayed down by 50%, just like they did in Japan. So indefinitely, for the next 10 years, prices didn't go up. What would that do to the US economy? What would that do to the US consumer? What would that do to their purchasing power? And then what would that do to the economy, understanding that one man's spending is another man's income? So now ask yourself the same question, but instead of property prices, going down by 50%, especially because that happens over a long period of time, what would happen if the stock market went down by 50 or 60% and never recovered, or at least took 10, 15 years to recover like we saw in Japan during the 1990s? I would argue that it would be just as bad from an economic standpoint as the housing market going down by 50%. So if what the BIS is telling us is that one of the main leading indicators of a banking crisis is property prices going up, I think the same rationale would apply to the stock market going up and going into a bubble, assuming that at some point in time, that bubble will deflate. And if it doesn't deflate in nominal terms, it will at least deflate in real terms, which could have an even bigger negative impact than it just going down uh, in nominal terms like we saw in the 1970s from 72 to 74, when, by the way, it went down by 50%. So let's tie this in to cryptocurrency. I don't think we're there yet, but let's just go through the reasons why we have seen so many or so much capital go into cryptocurrency. Well, a lot of that has to do with the Fed keeping interest rates at 0%. So you have a negative real yield, the financial suppression that we talked about. A lot of that would be through government transfer payments in the form of stimmies. I mean, you've you got to, no matter how bullish you are on Dogecoin uh, <laughs> as a cryptocurrency, you got to admit, probably one of the main reasons that Dogecoin has gone up as far as it has is because uh, you know young people were getting you know, these stimmy checks from the government and it's YOLO. You only live once. So they would just go on the ride, the coattails of Elon Musk. And they would just put all of that stimmy money right into Dogecoin because they're playing with the house's money. So I, I don't think anyone could argue that that wasn't a contributing factor. Okay. So we understand that. Uh, so then what happens is you build this economy. And if that represents an additional, let's say $1.5 trillion in purchasing power, just like the stock market and just like the US housing market represents future purchasing power, which is you know, one man's spending is another man's income, then we can come to the conclusion that if 
cryptocurrency continues to become a larger and larger portion of people's net worth, then the Fed and the government will be in the same position with cryptocurrency that they're currently in with the housing market and the stock market. And that is they can't allow it to go down. Because if the housing market goes down, if the stock market goes down, if it implodes, then so does the entire economy. Because the economy has been built around asset prices. So again, my point is maybe not now, but if in the future, the amount of wealth held by Americans in cryptocurrency becomes as significant as the stock market, the 401k, or the housing market. And again, I'm not saying it will. I'm just saying that let's just think through the probabilities here because it might. And if it does, then the government or the Fed is going to be in this very bizarre position where if cryptocurrency goes down by 50%, they may also have to come in and try to bail out the system by doing more quantitative easing, printing money, by examining what made cryptocurrency go up in the first place and continue to do more and more of that. It's just like the monetary heroin that the economy needs to continue at its same level always increases. It's just like the drug and the drug addict. So whatever it is that is pushing up the cryptocurrency prices now, what I'm saying is that could be, we could see that those um, we could see those those policies from the central planners continue into the indefinite future if 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 uh, cryptocurrency becomes as significant a portion of the average American's balance sheet as stocks or housing is right now. And I know a lot of you right now are saying, George, that's absolutely ridiculous because cryptocurrency will never ever 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 be as large an asset class as real estate. You may be right. You may be right. But uh, I think we need to really consider what if it happens. And we also need to understand that if you would have asked me that same question back in 2019, if you would have said, George, is the total market cap for cryptocurrency going to be one point or over two trillion within a year? Uh, I would have said, most likely not. So if it got to 2 trillion just as of a few months ago, who's to say it can't get up to four or five or 10 trillion before it comes crashing down? That's really my point. And I think it's something that all of us need to consider and think through.